Hi, and welcome. Welcome to No Diet Day. I'm Becky Clegg, your host, and you're here to hear about ending the diet mindset. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nita and about No Diet Day first, and then we'll get into the presentation. I'm really glad you're here. So the Nita Network is a group of 20 eating disorder nonprofits from across the country working collaboratively to advance the field of eating disorders and build a community of support. They provide a unified voice of strength and advocacy like they're doing with No Diet Day, social media campaign. The network has invited me to present my Ending the Diet Mindset workshop and share my book with you as part of No Diet Day 2020 because they felt it was a great fit and would provide information that was timely, especially during this pandemic when a lot of us are dealing with changes in our routines and limited access to resources and support. And a lot of us are bombarded with fear messages about our bodies and we're all isolated. So all of these elements could definitely influence disordered eating or eating disorder behavior. These messages include advice about exercise, criticism of body shapes and sizes, and diet talk. That's diet culture. And so um, you all are a part of this movement and we're so excited to have you here today. At the end of this session, I'm gonna share other ways that I can have you participate and, and, and that you can be part of this movement um, and a link to purchase my book, which is Ending the Diet Mindset. Um, thank you so much for being here. And I also wanted to say, I love interacting with the audience, uh, but clearly this is a webinar. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you to um, enter any questions you might have as I'm going through the information, and then I'll create some time at the end to make sure that I can answer those. I'm also gonna be on the Twitter chat tonight. So if any questions come up, we can engage um, there as well. So, all right, so we're gonna get started and bear with me and my technology as I share my screen. All right, so. Ending the Diet Mindset, How to Create a Healthy and Balanced Relationship with Food and Body Image. Um, this presentation is not forwarding. Hold on one second. Here we go with the, <laughs> with the technology. All right, let me take a look here. Sorry, guys. Aha, here we go. I have a few objectives for the presentation. Um, you know, when I chose to use the word health in the title of my book, I did so very, um, it, it was specifically to expand on the word health. So one of my objectives here is to redefine health in a broader, more comprehensive way, really so that we're including the whole person. And that includes the body, the mind, the emotional aspect of the person and the spirit. So this is way beyond just health in terms of the way we would define it medically and um, really give us an opportunity to redefine what health means for us because it's specific to each individual. Another objective would be to define and explore diet culture and diet mindset. Many of you probably have been exposed to those ideas. Maybe some of you, this is the first time you're hearing about diet culture. Um, so I wanna explain how, first of all, how diet culture came to be and what the resulting diet mindset is and how it's harmful to all of us. Um, and then of course, expand on some examples as well as give some examples of how we can redirect towards a more balanced and comprehensive attitude towards overall health. So I'm not going to leave you hanging with just explaining diet mindset, but we'll talk a little bit about how diet mindset can be um, tweaked and how we can begin to, um, okay, how we can begin to, um, I'm not sure if there was a technical glitch, but I've just been going over the objectives. Um, so basically what I'm talking about is today we're going to um, explore diet mindset and how we can, um, how it hurts us and how we can begin to do something to change that. So hopefully we're all on the same page now. Uh, but before we get started, I've done this presentation many times and there's always something I learned from the audience. So I include these before so that I don't forget. 
I have a practice, a private practice, therapy practice, where I work specifically with women. And so as a result, I tend to use the female pronoun. It's really important that I state that that is not meant to be exclusive. Diet mindset affects everyone, regardless of gender identity. And so if I say she, please understand that that is just by habit and default, and um, it is not exclusive. The other thing I like to mention here is that we're looking at the psychological aspect of diet mindset. Um, we're not talking in this case, when I talk about deprivation, about any kind of medical diagnosis that requires food modification. Okay, so people have come up to me after presentations and talked about different medical issues that cause them to have to restrict certain foods. That's not inherently what we're talking about. We're talking more about the emphasis on weight loss um, as defined by um, the culture that we live in. And so I do define diets specifically as a restriction of food intake or a specific food group for the purposes of weight loss. The other thing I like to mention is resources that I have for you. I always forget. And then I'm left just wishing I had said something. So um, I like to put as much information as I can out into the universe. And if ever you find yourself wanting more, please, um, go to my website and there's a free resource there. It's a 31 day self-love journey. It's a whole ebook for you, as well as following me on Instagram and on Facebook. I have both the icons there because I do try to get as much information out as possible, free information for you and those you love or those you think might benefit. So let's get into the meat of it. Why talk about diet mindset? Why are we even having this day? Why do we have a no diet day? Um, I love this picture because there's this old saying that a fish doesn't know that it's in water. And I think that that is how we experience diet culture. We are so ingrained in our culture and our culture is so ingrained in us that we don't even realize it, but it affects every single person. And so I'm not impervious to it any more than you are. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, we're still going to subconsciously internalize the messages. And so it's important that we unpack what those messages are, how they came to be, and how they're affecting us. Otherwise, we will act unconsciously and continue to play out something that we haven't really critically analyzed. What do I mean when I say diet mindset? Some people have asked me, what, what are you talking about? What's mindset, right? So a diet mindset, as I define it, it values weight, shape, and size over the holistic health and well-being of the person. So it's emphasis on weight loss over true health. And again, we'll get to what that is because it's defined differently by everybody, um, is, the, is the basis for this mindset. And of course, the mindset values what is currently in our culture a thin ideal. And it's important that I have this in quotes because it is arbitrary. We're going to look at the history of diet culture, but as we do, remember that it is arbitrary and it is based on whatever is culturally acceptable in this day and time. The um, history is that we know that 100 years ago, the ideal body shape for a female body was very, very different based on the fact that um, as we've studied historically in hierarchical societies, the cultural elite have always valued that which was difficult to obtain. So 100 years ago, it was difficult to obtain food. And it was, um, you know, as such, being in a body that was more robust showed uh, wealth, power, accessibility and whatnot. So that was the value ideal body size that has shifted post-industrial revolution as we have so much more access to food that it's actually more difficult at times to obtain this what we now have the thin ideal which we know is not healthy for 99.9 percent .9 of the bodies out there and again it's it's what um the society the current demands deem as acceptable but it's not um sort of set in one time and place it shifts and so 100 years from now, who knows what the ideal will be, but it is arbitrary. So diet culture and how we came to know it, it really started with the moralization of food. And so what we want to look at is how that came to be and why we still 
act from those mindsets. Food and food restriction became moralized around the turn of the century. And I have a definition from dictionary.com here of moralization because it's important that you understand what that is specifically in relation to food. To moralize is to reflect on or express opinions about something in terms of right or wrong. And here's the thing about food. Food is not right or wrong. Food is inherently neutral. It's just food. There's a certain amount of caloric expression. There's a certain amount of nutritional expression within each different food item. But its morality is neutral. And yet, that's no longer how we see it. And I think it's interesting that this particular definition <laughs> adds that to moralize something is especially done in a self-righteous or tiresome way, which I thought was funny because that's how I view a lot of the diet culture as it exists today. So we're going to take a look at how this started. And I think uh, most of you have had a graham cracker. I would think, um, or at least know what graham crackers are. But um, you can thank Sylvester Graham for the graham cracker. So not all bad things came out of diet culture and its inception. However, um, we look at that because in, if you look historically at diet culture, Sylvester Graham is really sort of the de facto founder of this diet reform movement, um, first seen around the 1830s. Um, and this was during a time known as the Great Second Awakening, which was a Protestant sort of revival, religious revival, uh, and moved into the early 19th century. But it was um, a lot about temperance and abolition. And um, what happened is the notion of perfectionism and the potential for achieving it was at the root of a lot of the reform movements. And this got transposed onto food. Sylvester Graham in particular, had a thing for um, really restrictive dieting. Apparently the graham cracker was thought to be a rather benign, um, kind of tasteless food. And so he, he pushed the cracker and that's how it became known as the graham cracker. I find them to be kind of yummy, but um, I guess it was supposed to be bland and the more bland and the less um, you know spicy, both your food and the way you lived your life, you were seen to be morally astute and um, so there was a correlation made at the time between um, restriction and moral sort of astuteness. And so this is where we first started seeing food and the concept of good or bad coming together. So how do we see that today? You know, you fast forward and can any of you guys relate to the idea of feeling like there are good or bad foods? And if you think about that, the notions may have come from different places, but do you ever feel good or bad because you ate a certain food? This is what's happened. All these many years ago, we had Alexander Graham and, and this sort of reformation. And here we are still living out the effects of that. Now, of course, it's gone through different iterations throughout time, but um, here we are today and there's still a modern day version of that. So that brings us to talking about what we in my industry call healthism and the wellness culture. And another word we use often, you've probably been exposed to it, and if you haven't, it's orthorexia. So I put down there, it is not a formal eating disorder diagnosis, but I share that in this presentation because orthorexia is culturally rampant and it's also um, very, uh, the word I'm looking for, it, it's it's seen as being um, something worth achieving. It's it's given a lot of praise, uh, just at a loss of words, but it's definitely something that is, um, you know, presented as a, a good goal here. Um, and the truth of the matter is it's actually a very disordered eating pattern. So orthorexia, as I define it, I'm not going to read off the screen, but it's um, an obsessive relationship with eating healthy. And I say healthy again, because there's different manifestations of that, but um, you know, compulsive checking of ingredients lists, nutrition labels, an increased concern about the health of all ingredients. You see a lot of folks today cutting out entire food groups um, under the guise of being healthy or wanting to eat healthy, um, maybe in an adaptation of a lifestyle um, that may be more about controlling your food intake than it is about necessarily aligning with values. I'm not saying that's the case for all people. Please hear me out. Um, I never 
can sit here and tell you what your relationship with food is like. You have to be the judge of that. I just know I've worked with a lot of people who might have um, chosen to take on a certain lifestyle that is restrictive. And when they really got down to it, their choice was a lot more about controlling weight and or being afraid of food than it was about aligning with a value system. Um, and so, you know, today, what I see a lot of and what you all would probably see a lot of as well is um, ways of eating such as paleo or um, a certain type of like free, sugar-free, gluten-free, et cetera, et cetera. And people ascribe to these in the, with the intention of being healthy. Um, and then what happens is an obsession occurs so that people can't live their life with, um, they can't go out with friends. They're constantly checking their macros or their labels or their numbers. Um, it really defines how they live their life and it makes their life a lot smaller. Um, and so we wanna take a look at how any of this might show up for you and or a loved one or somebody who you have in mind. Because um, while it's not a formal eating disorder diagnosis, it is disordered eating and it does actually work as a gateway oftentimes for eating disorder behavior. Um, and it's all in a continuum anyway. The question I want you to be asking yourself is if you see any of this without judgment, because again, we're all the fish swimming in water. But how is it really negatively affecting my life? And we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that I think it negatively affects our life and maybe that will show up for you. Um, but the moralization of food and food choices is something that we see now in what I call the good and bad list that almost everybody you talk to has with food. Moralization of food is something that would prize restriction so many people will say things like, I did good today, or I was good today, because they restricted certain foods. Um, and the truth of the matter is, what you put in your mouth has nothing to do with your inherent worth. Nothing at all. There's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. Whatsoever. If I stick, um, you know, processed, high fat, high carb food in my mouth versus a vegetable I picked off the ground, my worth doesn't change at all. But that's not how we act and that's not what many of us feel. And it's not our fault, but it is our job to begin to unpack it and ask ourselves how we wanna live going forward. Um, I will say it also leads to an increase in stress and anxiety. People, we are afraid of food. Um, we as a culture are afraid of food. And so think about the effects that fear and stress and trauma have on the body. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, it's impactful and there's really um, so many negative health consequences that come as a result of that. So to say that we're really doing it for our health is actually, um, it's well intended oftentimes, but it's actually missing the point because our health is actually more negatively affected by the stress incurred in the eating itself than, um, and, and than it would be had we not been doing it at all. Um, and then we also want to talk about the fact that diet culture has led to fat phobia, basically body shape and size. Um, we all have an internalized bias around that. And I'm going to play a link really quick. It's an audio link. Please let like the technology work that just speaks to how this is truly part of our culture. This is a link from This American Life um, for Elna Baker, for those of you who want to go follow up. Here we go. Good money, no whammies. All right. Yeah. I was hired to be a page at the Letterman Show. My job was to walk down the line of people waiting to go into the theater and divide them into three groups, dots, generals, and CBS twos. The dots were the beautiful people. They got seated in the first three rows. Usually those were the only rows you saw on television. Generals were average people. They sat in the order they arrived. CBS two was for fat people, elderly people with a visible illness, people who look like they might be disruptive, and goths. I'd scribble CDS2 on their ticket, and that was code for seat them in the back three rows of the balcony, the nosebleed seats. I'd seen Letterman a few years earlier. I was near the front of the line and somehow ended up in the nosebleeds. I remember being confused by it. The day I was trained, I put it together. Yeah. So, I mean, can you imagine 
Um, and, you know, I think that's probably just one example of how this fat phobia and internalized body size bias shows up. It's probably one of millions. And so um, just knowing that that's the culture we live in is so critical because every day, I mean, I tell my clients this all the time, I say, you'll step out of my office and you're going right back in to that, that culture. And so if we aren't mindful about making the choices of how we respond to it, it really does. Um, it's a difficult counterculture thing to do. And it, it, it's important that we as a community are really mindful about what we're up against here. Um, so what are some of the messages and the mindsets that diet culture spreads? I love this graphic. Um, you know what's healthier than kale? Having a good relationship with food. See, here's the thing, if you know me, I'm obsessed with kale salads. I love kale. So I'm not saying kale is good or bad. Uh, it depends on what your palate says. Um, what the meme is about though, is that if you don't have a good relationship with food, good being defined as one that you're at peace with, then kale itself is not necessarily healthy, especially if you're um, feeling stress and if you have sort of a trauma response to food. So um, a lot of people know this, but I wanna go over some things about diet, diet mindset and what diets do to us. Um, Cause it's a hard sell, you know, so many people, it's just how they live their life. It's constantly being on a food restrictive diet. But, um, Diet really has been shown, dieting, restrictive dieting for weight loss purposes has been shown to be this sort of gateway into eating disorder behavior. And that's not to say that everybody that's been on a diet will develop an eating disorder, but a lot of people go into their diet well-intended, feeling like they're doing something healthy for their body, and it does result in an eating disorder. This 2011 study says 35% of occasional dieters develop into pathological eating disorders, um, as many as 25% being uh, full-blown eating disorders. So, you know, I think those numbers alone speak to how problematic it is. And I, my belief is that even just that occasional dieting is so destructive to the homeostasis of the body, and we'll talk about that. Um, but dieting itself also promotes a systemic cultural distraction. So I always ask my clients, if you could take back all the time that you spent dieting, that you've spent worrying about food and use it in a way that felt productive or just felt good to you, what would you do? Um, you know, so many people are so obsessed with dieting and have such a entrenched diet mindset that they're not really able to live what I would call their best life, meaning the life that perhaps they were here, um, if you believe that, to, to lead or their purpose, um, but they're very distracted and it takes up a massive amount of real estate in their head. Um, and it also, diet culture also, there's, there's this distortion between thin and healthy. You know, thin does not necessarily equate to healthy, but that is not how we function as a society. Um, just as fat does not necessarily equate to unhealthy. But again, that is not the message that so many of us have received. And, you know, I tell a story about um, a time in my life where I was going through a breakup and I was really going through a difficult time. And sometimes when I'm having difficulties with emotions, my appetite goes away. It's just sort of what happens. And so my body weight was down. And I remember going to the doctor because I knew I wasn't healthy at the time and I was just looking to make some healthier adjustments. And the doctor, first thing he said was he came in and he praised my weight and um, just kind of went on and on about it. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm not in the healthiest place I've ever been. I know that. But because again, a lot of the, the models here are that thin equates to healthy. He came in just thinking everything was fantastic. And it was a really, you know, awkward conversation to have to have, but I had it and, and you know, moved on. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's just really important that we don't look at a person's body and think that we can um, evaluate their health because we cannot. And that is something that diet culture does not promote. 
this uh, slide is an abomination, apparently, <laughs> an abomination of uh, PowerPoint slides. I don't think you're supposed to stick all this tiny um, text. So I'm not going to read it to you. And really, all I want you to take away from this slide is dieting doesn't work. And here are all the reasons. If you want to go back, I can give you the PDF and I can give you the slides. But um, there's massive amounts of data. In fact, I got a lot of this data from um, the NIDA website itself. So you can go over and check it out. Um, here's the thing. 95% of diets fail, and most weight gain will be um, within one to five years. People will gain the weight that they lost back and then some. Um, and again, weight itself is relatively neutral, but it's just that this is often how people are told to be healthy. And it is a prescription. It's actually you know, told to them, well, if you lose weight, and inherent in that message is go on a diet, then... X, Y, and Z will get better. So whatever markers they're talking about may or may not adjust. But the issue is that the way to go about getting the adjustment in the marker is flawed and does not work and is not sustainable. So we as a culture and you know the health um, profession, healthcare profession, can't in good conscience be prescribing dieting as a way to get what's quote unquote health because it doesn't work. In fact, what I'm going to show you is it actually harms the body more because there's a yo-yo effect. And over time that disrupts the metabolism and it's really damaging psychologically and it's really damaging emotionally. So we're prescribing something that not only doesn't work, but damages people. So we really need to rethink how we look at health and how we look at those markers. And we're going to start by looking at one of the 10 diet mindsets that I talk about in my book, which I think is something we've all, if you've ever been on a diet, um, and I'm going to use COVID as some examples since it's relevant, um, everybody's experienced this in some way, even if it's not with food. So we're going to be talking about the deprivation mindset. So I have this little slide that shows you different aspects of the mindset, and that is intended to help you recognize it when it shows up for you. So the mindset type is a lack mindset. You know, it's prefaced off of this idea that I am not going to have enough. There is not enough available. But what it might sound like if it shows up in your mind, if you have a thought, is there are only certain foods that I can eat. The rest are off limits. Well, how many of you have ever been on a diet? Isn't that the premise of most diets? And the cause is what we refer to as deprivation syndrome. So the idea that focusing on what we cannot have signals the brain to obsess over that very thing. And that's deprivation syndrome. So if I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant, what did you just think of? You thought of a pink elephant. The brain focuses on the subject of the sentence. Um, and it just has a tendency to do that. It's part of how the, the, the brain is designed. And so if I say, don't eat this kind of food, uh, then what the brain is going to hear is this kind of food. For those of you um, wondering why I'm not saying specific kind of foods, I'm trying to be um, conscientious that certain uh, food references can be triggering to certain people. So it's kind of common uh, practice to try to avoid talking about specific foods. But um, something that's really interesting is what's happening right now uh, in the time of COVID-19, and that is that we're seeing this show up in some ways. Somewhere, somebody got the idea that we might need toilet paper during this um, quarantine. And somebody must have thought that there wasn't going to be enough. Um, and so that somehow spread collectively, and people started to hoard toilet paper. So we're going to use that as another example. I'm not laughing. Um, it's, not, it's not funny. But yet, there is an irony to it. And I don't think anybody's needing toilet paper specifically because of COVID. But um, that's another example of how deprivation syndrome works. Um, the belief is there won't be enough, then the drive is to get as much as possible, okay? So action equals reaction. Restriction equals the craving or the binge. I don't think I'm gonna have enough toilet paper because someone out there put that idea in my mind. I'm frightened, therefore, I'm gonna go buy 16 cases. It just, it's how it works. So. We can talk a little bit about um, the Ansel Keys study and let's see if I have enough time. Um, yeah, we've got a three minute 
video on the Ansel Keys study that um, I'll show. But the idea around it is that what they proved is when people have food taken away, it increases their drive for food. Um, and it's really interesting as you watch this video, I want you to watch that the um, calorie intake was actually 1750, which is far greater than most modern day diets will allow people to eat. Okay, so hopefully this works. And it takes you right to YouTube. Ha! Okay, here we go. Professor Mann was damning, but amazingly, she isn't the first scientist in Minnesota to uncover the problems with diets. Over 60 years ago, before the modern diet industry had even begun, scientists here were already examining the effect of cutting calories on the body. In 1944, an experiment took place here at the football stadium at the University of Minnesota. 36 men volunteered to live on a diet of just 1,500 calories a day for six months. It was done to find out what happens to the human body when it's starved. The experiment was run by the world's leading nutritionist, Anthel Keyes. The American government wanted to understand the effect malnutrition would have on war-torn Europe. The men were housed in windowless rooms beneath the stadium. They were given a program of mental and physical exercises and monitored throughout. Their diet of just over 1,500 calories was strictly controlled. Being starved made them lose weight, but it also had profound psychological effects on them. This is an extract from one of the volunteers' diaries. April 24th, 1945. I'm beginning to want to isolate myself from the other subjects. We're developing all kinds of weird behaviours. Everyone seems to be losing their interpersonal skills. The starvation is less than half over. One of them bit one of the other volunteers. Many tried to escape from the compound to eat grass from nearby gardens. Another became so deranged, he chopped three of his fingers off with an axe. I mean, this is what a diet based on half of a normal calorie intake did to these people in less than six months. The key's most important discovery for the diet industry was what happened after the diet ended. When Keith started feeding them again after six months, he noticed something unexpected. They rapidly put on weight, but not only did that, they actually gained more weight than they had been originally. Dieting had actually made them fatter. What would you say the significance of the Keys study was in terms of what we know about diets today? Basically, I think of it as the first diet study. I mean, the more I look at his books, the more I'm amazed at how much he figured out about how diets work back then. He showed that trying to lose weight long term by dieting wouldn't work for the vast majority of people. And from that place, I think what we're gonna just uh, take away from that is that what happens when food is restricted is that the consumption of food when the food is reintroduced is exponential. And they have animal studies that show this as well. Um, there's some, in the food addiction research, the world of food addiction, which is a controversial topic unto itself, but one of the things that's coming out of that is that um, they're showing that even highly palatable food is not addictive in and of itself. Rather, it is the manner in which the food is presented, which is intermittently and consumed, which is intermittent gorging, that appears to entrain the addiction-like process. So again, what that's talking about is if food is taken away and then presented, taken away and then presented, that on and off um, availability of the food creates the compulsion towards eating it. And so for anecdotal purposes, we can look at the toilet paper. Um, I, prior to COVID, I used to use um, the example of depression era hoarding as sort of this 
idea of supply and demand. I know for a lot of people that have a relative or a loved one who lives through that, they might see behaviors that are still to this day uh, in in their, their repertoire of behaviors that involve maybe hoarding money or maybe hoarding resources. Because once you are exposed to deprivation syndrome, the body will respond in, in kind as a way of self-preservation and protection. And so you see how a simple diet could actually really, really break and interfere with our body's natural capacity to know when to eat and when not. Diets disrupt our relationship, inherent, that inherent relationship with hunger fullness. And we're left in this sort of, um, you know, ebb and flow, sort of restriction and then binge kind of relationship with food. Oh goodness, all of the, okay. So when you deprive yourself of food, the brain receives the message that there's a shortage. And this is what is important to remember. Our brains are really rather primitive, okay? And so all your brain knows is that there's a shortage of food. The thing is, is our brain, the part of your brain that is going to send the hunger and the, the uh, hunger signal and the fullness signal, that part of the brain has no concept of what life is like today. As far as it's concerned, you're still out hunting and gathering. Um, we haven't evolved in that part of the brain. Um, the front brain, the frontal cortex has evolved, but what's called the back brain or um, the brain stem has not, and that's where our hunger fullness cues come from. And so as far as it knows, we're hunting and gathering on the Serengeti and any sort of shortage of food is interpreted as a threat. So you may be intending to go on a diet and you cut out a food group or three or six or whatever it is that's popular these days. And the interpretation in your brain is shortage threat. So this is what happens. Your brain then increases the mental focus on the food you cannot have. This is why folks that go on a diet, usually on Monday, because most people start their diets on Mondays, um, by Friday, they can do nothing other than think about food. And they feel so disparaged because they feel like they don't have willpower, this notion of willpower, when actually their brain and their body is trying to help them survive what it thinks is the impending, oh, I don't know, drought or famine. Um, it's got nothing to do with rational thought, okay? This is a primitive survival reflex. And so it's really important that you understand that when you restrict your food, you are triggering that reflex, okay? This survival reflex is parallel to the survival and defense mechanism of your body's trauma response. And I, I promise you, I wouldn't read the slides and I won't. You can read this slide. It's by uh, Besser van der Kolk um, from his book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is fantastic. Any of you have read it, I'm sure. The part I want to focus on is the latter part though. When it talks about However, from the dot, 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 if your sleep is disturbed or your bowels don't work or you always feel hungry, okay, who has ever been on a diet and they didn't feel hungry, so, so that's the operative part there, the entire organism is thrown into this equilibrium, okay? So what this is talking about is that it's sort of like that hierarchy of needs, like if there are basic needs that aren't being met and food is a basic need. This is why eating disorders and working around food is so complex and complicated because it is a basic survival need. Um, and when we mess with it and we tweak it so that we can alter our bodies to fit into society's ideal, we are messing with primary defense mechanisms. And if you're not getting fed, the body and the mind together in tandem will do everything it can to assure that you do get fed. Um, and this is where the disruption occurs. So I have a little slide in here. I can't talk about this stuff without talking about the nervous system. All I want you to take away is that, uh, so the, the sympathetic nervous system is the part that gets triggered when there's a threat, okay? It thinks it's helping you. And this is what I want you to take away. You are not failing when you go on a diet on Monday and by Thursday, you wanna eat everything in sight. You're not, if anything, your sympathetic nervous system and all of your body's primitive reflexes are doing everything it can to help you survive. So there is no moral, kick it back to the moralization of food, um, you know, 
deficiency here. You're not not strong enough. You're not weak or any of the things I've heard clients say. If anything, your body is working overtime to make sure you survive. And I want you to begin to look at it from that perspective. It's the diet that is failing. The diet is breaking the system that worked love and it worked perfectly. Um, and so, you know, it, the sympathetic nervous system is not wrong. The diet is. So I just think this is kind of, I, I love metaphor and imagery, but this is your brain on a diet. By the day, maybe three or four of your diet, of your restrictive diet, all you can do is think about getting food. And so I use these slides. I have no idea if these are accurate or not. I found them on somewhere on the internet, but I use them because I wanted something that spoke to the primitive brain and the fact that the part of your brain that is seeking out food is no more evolved than these guys here on this slide um, all those many years ago. So what do we do with that? How do we undo deprivation mindset? And so I love this, clearly I'm a fan of Vander Kolk. <laughs> I always call him Vessel Vanderbeek because I'm from the 90s and I always think of James Vanderbeek and I was on stage and I got it confused. <laughs> And so now it's just constantly in my mind. Um, if those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, just Google Dawson's Creek. But um, Van der Kolk says for real change to take place, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed and to live in the reality of the present. For real change to place, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed. That's what I am trying to impass in this slide. When we want to undo deprivation mindset, our body has to believe that we are no longer going to deprive it, which means that we have got to stop restricting food. Now, we can't just be BSing ourselves either. So the beginning step is to begin to unpack what are your food rules, okay? Breaking deprivation mindset requires that we focus on what we can eat and release the restriction around the foods that are off limits. So a couple of sort of beginner where do I begin? You know, people will say to me, where do I, where do we start with that? Uh, creating this abundance mindset around food. You know, we are post-industrial revolution at this point. There's food. I used to say on every corner, now half the places aren't open, but we still have an abundance of food. And of course, I want to recognize some have more access than others. I am very aware certain people don't have as much access to food as others. And that, of course, will increase this deprivation feeling. Um, but most people living in our, our modern day America and you know, modern day westernized society have some access to food. And so from that place, um, we have to start feeling that. And I, I say feeling because it's really a bottom up kind of thing. You can't say, oh yeah, all foods are, are allowed and then secretly have certain foods you won't eat because your body knows that. And so this is about beginning to expose yourself to foods that maybe you have had difficulty with in the past, if you've had batter food lists. I always say, if you have a history of disordered eating and this feels at all uncomfortable, please try to find a dietitian and or a therapist to help you through this process. Um, if you go to IADEP, they have a list of certified eating disorder professionals and I recommend anyone on that list, but certainly there are plenty of people who aren't um, certified as well. Just make sure they have experience in disordered eating work. Um, but, you know, learning to love foods again, I times will have my clients keep an ongoing love list where if they remember foods that they used to like as kids before they were dieting and or if they're exposed to foods that they really enjoy as they're beginning to creep out into trying foods again, put it on your list. They keep it on a note on their phone because it's ongoing. Um, but it tells the brain by addressing it, by putting it on a list. I love that food. I love that food. I love that food. Whereas dieting will say, don't eat that food. Don't eat that food. Ooh, don't eat that food. And we need to sort of move towards food is abundant. Food is great. I enjoy food. And away from food is fearful. Food is limited. Food is bad. So we're reconnecting with pleasure because food is inherently meant to be pleasurable. We have to unlearn this fear of food that we have. You know, a lot of folks during COVID are talking about, oh, they're emotionally eating and, you know, I'm an emotional eater and stuff. And I think it's important to recognize we are all emotional eaters. That's one part of what food is about. Food is about experiencing pleasure and joy. It's inherent in the things that are necessary for 
the propagation of the species. So food and sex are both really pleasurable. We need to eat and we have to have sex in order for the species to continue. And so whoever created whoever made all of this made them pleasurable so that we would do it more and so it's not bad you're not inherently wrong because you're an emotional eater in fact that just means you're human so all of those things are mindset shifts that you can begin to internalize take to your therapist talk to your friends about sit with yourself around how you might need to work on some of these mindset shifts and how it could benefit you um talked a little bit about telling the food the brain that food is abundant. Um, one of the things that is really important when you first start doing this work is that you always give yourself permission to have more. So you might, you know, go and have a portion of something and you can say, look, I'm just going to have this amount and I can have more if I need it. I'm not going to restrict food anymore. Dieting is gone. I won't do that to you again. This is you talking to you. Um, I talked about the love list. Um, focus on increasing behaviors that are healthy. Again, health is very relative here okay healthy for you is what feels good to your body but it goes way beyond this sort of narrow definition of health i look at health as improved relationships movement sleep hygiene balance in your life managing stress nurturing your body you know there's plenty of times where the healthy choice for me is to sit and watch netflix instead of go out and, and get exercise you know because balance is so critical so Looking at though the behavioral measures, um, not at food and not at weight is really important. Avoiding the urge to restrict. So you wanna stay in the middle. I talk about the pendulum swing. You know, if you pull a pendulum back and then you let go, it's gonna swing to the other side. Another um, imagery for those who grew up going to like amusement parks was the dragon swing or the Viking swing. But the more, the higher you go on a swing, then you come across and go equally as high on the other side. and I talk about that, like the more you restrict, the more you're going to then feel that urge to consume and or binge. So don't pull the pendulum back, okay? It's really hard. Once the pendulum gets going, you don't wanna like be a wall that meets it. Where you, where you have more efficacy is don't pull it back. So don't restrict. Um, and that's tough. A lot of people right after they feel like they've binged or they've eaten more than you know their diet mindset might allow them to they want to go into restriction it feels like the right thing to fix it that's where you stay in the middle and you just allow yourself to eat when hungry again um, because restriction is what causes the binge or the, the um, obsession around food again that's middle path behavior that's a term that comes from dbt um, but it's trying to stay in the balance i talk about practicing gray meals for some people and that's intentionally mixing up foods that they would have had on their bad list and good list. So, you know, it's like eat the kale salad with an order of french fries. I just talked about specific foods. Sorry if that's triggering, but um, that's an example of middle path kind of gray meal behavior. And it's to confuse the brain. It's to tell the brain there are no more and or. There is no more dichotomous kind of good bad lists, but rather everything exists. Um, and then, you know, of course, eating from what you want as well. Um, and then learning set point theory, that's an important piece too. And really all it is, is that all of our bodies have a set point and that set point can be this range, you know, and it's referring to weight and, you know, little caveat here, weight is at all triggering for you. I don't recommend that you weigh yourself, um, it kind of goes without saying. But for those of you who do know your weight, understand that we, most of our human bodies are gonna exist in some set point. And that means that for many of us, this effort to be at a certain weight that the society's idea um, will require constant deprivation and, and sort of requires that you bypass your hunger fullness cues um, in order to do that. And that is not sustainable and it harms you. So um, the idea is that if you eat and attend to your hunger fullness cues and you know allow yourself to have diversity in food, that there is the body uh, we'll find its set point and we'll stay there. Um, and to begin to look for that and to understand that that is where your body wants to be. So we're gonna talk a little bit here about another element of dieting and how it really, this is a, a far more um, psychological element of dieting, but what dieting does to us. And I call this the externalized mindset. So this is a really helpless mindset. It, puts us in a position where we no longer trust 
ourselves. We no longer are the experts in knowing what we need to eat. And it is a reliance on external knowledge versus internal wisdom. I tell everybody that I work with, I try to, I try to remember this. Nobody has your answers or your wisdom, including me. There is no such thing as a guru. And if somebody is telling you that they are, my advice is run. Um, because you know what's best for you. And only you know when you're hungry, what you want, and how much of it you need. Because those signals come from inside of you. It's introception. Um, and so a book or an expert who's saying, eat this much at this time in this quantity, is doing this based off some formula that has no access to what's going on in your day-to-day -day life and what you actually need. And so dieting and following this way of eating, again, primitive need, we give our power away to other people and other um, industries, quite frankly, and we lose a connection with ourselves when we do that. So I talk a lot about how dieting promotes disconnection because it primes us to seek our wisdom outside of ourselves. And it denies interception. So interception is the sense of the like internal state of the body. It can be conscious and unconscious, but um, what I'll often say um, to a client is, would you find it odd? Oh, I'll say it to you guys. Would you find it odd if I stopped this webinar right now and told you all you needed a bathroom break? I would, if I were on your side of the, the, the camera, I would find it really weird and for good reason. How the heck could I possibly know if you needed to go to the bathroom? That's not anything anyone could tell you. That comes from inside. You're the only one that can know that. And so that's really what's happening when somebody is saying, oh, it's time to eat or don't eat or you know, giving you some cue about hunger. Hunger comes from inside. It's a felt experience. There's a felt sense of need. And we are born knowing how to do that. All babies come, I mean, basically knowing like when they're hungry, when they're full, they'll let you know, um, they'll stop eating. And so we've lost this connection through diet culture and giving our power away to an external industry, you know, institution. There's a lot of uh, reasons why diet culture exists, but the point I want you to take away here is it promotes a disconnection, which is inherently emotionally and, and, and quite frankly, I think spiritually harmful. Um, no one outside of you can tell you. Um, and we have to learn to trust ourselves. So what's really beautiful about the recovery process and or just learning how to disconnect from diet culture is there's a real, um, I, I think it's a spiritual thing. That's the term I use, um, but it brings us back home. It, it allows us to come back to self for our answers. And to me, that's like beautiful and watching people find that connection again is really rather miraculous and so it's a lot more than about giving up diet culture it's about learning how to come back to ourselves and reconnect and reattach to ourselves um you know what we want to think about let me see i think the janine ross slide is next uh, it is i i am going to read this to you i promise i wouldn't read the slides and i'm going to do that so sorry, breaking my promise, but it's a really good quote. When we give up dieting, we take back something that we were often too young to know we'd given away. And that's our own voice. Our ability to make decisions about what to eat and when. Our belief in ourselves. Our right to decide what goes into our mouths. Unlike the diets that appear monthly in magazines or the thermal pants, the sweat off pounds, unlike a lover, a friend, a car, your body is reliable. It does not go away doesn't get lost or stolen. And if you listen, it will speak. So that's from Janine Roth. I clearly it's dated because I don't think anyone's worn thermal pants since the eighties, but heck who knows? I'm sure they'll come back around. The point of this though, is she goes from talking about dieting right into we've lost our voice. You know, um, we've lost our best our, our oldest and our dearest friend, which is our body. We've lost the connection to that. And that is one of the greatest travesties that occurs. And we think we're just going on a diet. We have no idea what we're giving up. Um, so many of us, sadly, are so young when we go on our first diet. I think I was 11 maybe when I went on my first diet, maybe 10. I mean, my God, I look at a 10 year old now and I mean, it's just a baby, right? And so it's like, I, I wasn't even formed and I gave up that connection. So we wanna really think much deeper 
than just the diet itself. Um, graphics get me every time. So how do we bring connection back to self? Um, and I'm gonna say in an hour and a half, I am going like full speed ahead. There's no way I'm getting half of what I wanna be able to get across to you. Um, so just know that these are the highlights and clearly if you have any questions, you can reach me out through my website. But mindfulness is a huge part of connecting and mindful eating is a great way not only to learn about your relationship with food, but also reconnect with the self and reattune with yourself and your needs. So deliberately paying attention, hopefully without judgment, in the present moment, being mentally and emotionally and physically available while we eat is really important. And trying to notice what comes up, the feelings of hunger, the feelings of fullness. I mean, how many of you can really relate to like, what does that even feel like in your body? What are the thoughts you have? What are the emotions that come up? You know, three different things. There's a lot to pay attention to. And while I won't read these these bullet points to you, what I'll say is one of the ways to do that is to try to create opportunities to be with your food that don't have distraction and that's hard hard it's it's really it's a lot harder than uh it sounds it's easy for me to say not so easy for me to do turning off the tv putting down the phone um really being present and, and slowing down can be very difficult for many of us i think again covid reference but having to slow down and having to limit our access to distractions has been really hard for a lot of us i include myself in that it shows how um, primed we are for stimulation, um, external stimulation, but how much is missed when we're constantly being stimulated externally, we're not able to hear that information that's coming from inside. So um, I would say in the context of the time we have together, practicing mindful eating intentionally as much as possible is a great way to start that connection. And you can take that and work with your therapist or your dietitian on um, how to take that deeper. Oh, seemed like a good time, a good, a good thing at the time to make all these cool graphics, but. Um, okay, so the third element, and these are only three out of the 10, but they're the three I chose to talk about today. Um, the 10 that are in the book, I should say, but is the playing small mindset. And again, this is another emotional, a negative emotional consequence, psychological and emotional that occurs as a result of dieting. And so think about what dieting espouses. Dieting espouses that you are better if you are taking up less space. Essentially, that's what diet culture is saying. You are better, you are more desirable if you take up less space. So inherent in our diet culture is that message, which promotes fear of taking up space in the first place. So it's a fear-based mindset. What it might sound like, this is kind of tricky, but if you're having a thought, what might sound like is, I'm not sure, what do you think? When you actually have an opinion, playing small to me is pretending that you don't exist. So I'm gonna get as little as possible. I'm gonna say as little as possible. I'm gonna need as little as possible. Think about restriction. I don't need food would equate to, I don't need anything. I don't have needs. I'm not gonna take up space. Um, and so we, again, we give our power away. It's externalized. You go ahead and decide, you take up space, you choose, as opposed to really taking up the space that really is yours at the table, metaphorically speaking. Um, and what causes this? Well, I think it's a variety of things. It's too simplistic to put in a slide, but a lot of times it's influenced by our diet culture and it's the fear of being too much or not enough, which I believe is really predicated around belonging and our need for attachment. We're, we're really driven to attach and terrified of not attaching. So we shape ourselves to fit what we're told is valuable and is acceptable. And again, in this culture, that is to shrink ourselves. So the playing small mindset, it's about restriction, but not just restriction of our food, it's a restriction of our life. You know, we can talk about restricting food or reducing calories, but it's also limiting our options. It really, we have to stay within the lines in order to play by those rules. And think about how that message gets internalized for so many people. Um, constantly living by the rules 
and this mindset sends a really clear message. Don't take up too much space, literally and figuratively. Now, I could do a whole talk on the diet industry and how it's literally dependent on you thinking that there's something wrong with you. Um, many industries are. Because if you don't need to fix yourself, if you're not broken and you don't need their product to fix it, they have nothing to sell you. So it is imperative that the message be sent loud and clear that you're not okay. As long as you believe that, they are in the money. And we know it's a billion dollar industry. And um, how many of you can think about the amount of money that you might have spent? I, I my God, what I have to do with how many dog charities could I could I donate that money to at this point in my life? You know, hindsight, 2020. No pun intended. Um, but the fear of taking up space is predicated around the fear of not enoughness. And you think about enoughness when it comes to hunger fullness. So many of my clients, they don't know what enough feels like. They don't have that felt sense. They don't have the internalized benchmark. So when it comes to food, they don't know either. They don't know when they're full. But they also don't have the sense of who they are in terms of enoughness. So there's a parallel there. Um, you know, there's this real fear that if we express our needs, we're going to cause someone else harm. A lot of clients will say things like, I don't want to take up too much space. Um, I don't want to intrude. I don't want to bother anybody. This is a denial of appetite. And again, I could do a whole presentation on the cultural oppression aspect of diet culture. But if we can get mass amounts of people to deny their appetite, deny their physical hunger, their sexual appetite, deny their desire to acquire life goals beyond their gender roles, um, deny their desire to grow, um, then we have people playing by our rules and we've got people under our control. So I say this because there's this massive piece of how diet culture is in alignment with the patriarchal society. Keep in mind, patriarchy is not about disliking men in any way, shape, or form. I think that's a misinterpretation of it. The patriarchy, in fact, affects men as the way it affects women. It affects all of us. It's really a hierarchical um, power over, power under setup. And dieting keeps you in power under. Um, you aren't able to access your true appetites and take up the space in your life. So it's um, really, let me see here if we have time. There's a real quick video I want to show. And uh, this is of a young lady who is doing a poetry slam, which I find to be fascinating that she can do this, um, quite a skill. But she talks about how this affected her in her life and her family. And I just think she does it so well. I want to uh, show this to you. Hopefully it comes up. Oh, sorry. I had it all set up. Oh, wait, here it is. Let's do this. Okay. Across from me at the kitchen table, my mother smiles over red wine that she drinks out of a measuring glass. She says she doesn't deprive herself, but I've learned to find nuance in every movement of her fork. In every wiggle in her brow as she offers me the uneven pieces on her plate, I've realized she only eats dinner when I suggest it. I wonder what she does when I'm not there to do so. Maybe this is why my house feels bigger each time I return. <laughs> As she shrinks, the space around her seems increasingly vast. She wakes while my father waxes. His stomach has grown round with wine, late night oysters, poetry, a new girlfriend who was overweight as a teenager, but my dad reports now she's crazy about fruit. It was the same with his parents. As my grandmother became frail and regular, her husband swelled to red, round cheeks, rotund stomach, and I wonder if my lineage is one of women shrinking, making space for the ends of men in their lives. Once they leave, I have taught accommodation. My brother never thinks before he speaks. I have been taught to filter. How can anyone to chip to food, he asked, laughing, as I ate the black bean soup I chose for its lack of carbs. I want to say we come from difference, Jonas. You have been taught to grow out. I have been taught to grow in. You will learn from our father how to commit, how to produce, to roll each thought off your tongue with confidence. You used to lose your voice every other week from shouting so much. I learned to absorb. 
I took lessons from my mother in creating space around myself. I learned to read the knots in her forehead while the guys went out for oysters. And I never meant to replicate her, but spend enough time sitting across from someone and you pick up their habits. And that's why women have been changing for decades. We all learn it from each other, the way each generation taught the next one to knit weaving silence in between the threads, which I can still feel as I walk through this ever-growing hump. I've been itching, picking up all the habits my mother has unwittingly dropped, like piece of crumbled paper from her pocket on her countless trips from bedroom to kitchen to bedroom again. Nights I hear her creep down to eat plain yogurt in the dark, a fugitive stealing calories to which she does not feel entitled. Besides, how many bites is too many? How much space she deserves to occupy? Watching the struggle, I either mimic or hate her, and I don't want to do either anymore, but the burden of this house has followed me across the country. I asked five questions in genetics class today, and all of them started with the word sorry. I don't know the past of oh, I don't know the past of to the sociology major because I spent the whole meeting deciding whether or not I could have another piece of pizza. Uh, a circular obsession I never wanted, but inheritance is accidental. Uh, Still staring at me with wine soaked lips from across the kitchen table. <laughs> I have seen that. Uh, I use that in almost every time I do this presentation, and every single time it, it gets me because it is so inherited and so, um, it is so, what's the word I'm looking for? Ingrained in who we are and, and how we function as a society that so many people pass this down and don't mean to. Um, and it is so important that you think about how this affects everybody in your life. You know, if you make a comment about your body, how people hear that and they internalize it, whether they want to or not. Um, so I just think she's fantastic and that video always, always gets me. But the idea, the takeaway here is that you are playing small when you're following a diet and it's harming you in that regard. So what do we do with that? Um, I tell you, it's an ongoing relationship with change, but I will give you some sort of takeaway pointers for brevity's sake. Paying attention to body language and posture is really cool and important, but cool. Um, our bodies say so much without our minds really even needing to come online, our, our frontal lobes. Um, Pay attention to how you position yourself. There's an Amy Cuddy TED Talk, for those of you who haven't seen it, but it talks about the Superman pose, which is kind of like how Superman stands with really wide open through the chest, shoulders back, and how if you're ever feeling nervous, you can do that pose. And from doing that pose, you'll decrease your anxiety response. And it just really uh, speaks to what I'm addressing here, which is learning how to take up some space in your body is a way to challenge this playing small mindset. I always find this interesting on airplanes, um, which clearly I'm not on these days, but um, when we get back to being on airplanes, hopefully soon, um, you know, I sit like a pretzel and I will notice that oftentimes that is not the case for people that might have been socialized to feel like they can take up space. Um, you know, and I wonder why am I doing that? It's unconscious. And I have to remind myself, uncross your legs, relax. Take up the space in your seat. Um, but I too have been cult like a lot of the cultural messages I received were about playing small, and my body is still um, responding in kind. So paying attention to body language and posture and playing with that can actually just be a good way to challenge old belief systems um, and to practice intentional receiving. This is an interesting one. So not taking up space would mean I don't have any needs. No, I don't need any help. You, you oftentimes see that. So I have clients start really what I call in a benign space, meaning something that isn't particularly challenging. So I'm not saying you should, you know, like go ask the person you're in a conflicted relationship with to like meet some great need of yours. I mean, like when you're at the grocery store, clearly a lot of us aren't going to the grocery store right now, but again, <laughs> life hopefully gets back to some semblance of normal. Um, and somebody asks if you want help bagging your groceries or somebody says, can I help you out with that? Say yes. Just say it, even if you don't want to, even if you don't need the help, just receive it. See what that feels like. What are the thoughts that come up? Um, challenging 
old unconscious behaviors is a way to get great information because discomfort will rise. And if you're paying attention and willing to sit with that discomfort, it will tell you what the old belief is, the one you need to work on and hopefully transform with a new mindset. I also tell people, try to go inside out as much as possible. So that's start with what do I think, need, want, as opposed to what do they need, think, want. So an example of that would be if you have a history of people pleasing and or conflict avoidance, which oftentimes if you recognize yourself in the playing small mindset, those might be some parallel things that, that show up for you. Not always, but sometimes. Um, then your training is to go out in, meaning if something is placed on the table, like what would you like for dinner tonight? I don't, what do you want? What are you up for? You know, how can you be pleased? And I will align with that as opposed to really, what do I want? It's kind of like the same thing if you're in a social setting. Um, those of you that constantly are concerned with what is that person thinking about me? Instead, what do I think about that person? Um, be the person who is interviewing instead of the interviewee. You know, when you're going in for an interview, you're like, oh, do they like me? Are they going to want to hire me? We're really like, we're, we're needing the approval of the other. So always remember, stay in the role of the interviewer, okay? And that will help train you to go back inside first. I'm not saying you should be obtuse to other people's needs. Quite the contrary. It's a compromise. But if you're going outside first, then in, there's a disconnection. And it's important to shift that. Once you know what you need, you can listen to other people's opinions and hopefully reach a compromise. Um, be careful of the I'm sorry's. I think it was a really awesome one she said started five sentences in class today with I'm sorry. You, you don't have to be sorry, but instead you can say I thank I thank you. So um, yeah, thanks for thanks for hearing me. I just wanted to, you know, ask this question. Um, instead of saying, oh I'm sorry I have to go, you know, like, you know, take up this space, you can say thank you for, for giving me a moment to take up the space. I don't think anybody would actually verbalize that, but this is the internal mindset shift. Um, or I suppose you can, you know, it's some example I saw on the internet was instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm five minutes late, say, thank you for waiting. I really appreciate that. It's a subtle shift, but man, is it powerful. Um, and then I left this on uh, erroneously. This is, I have a presentation I do to clinicians, and then I have a presentation I, I offer um, to everyone, and, and I left this on there, but it says, explain to the client how this slow and steady um, start to receiving parallels their process of receiving food in a joyful way. So uh, all that means is the more you're able to take into your life, the more you're able to say, yes, help me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And to be with reception, you're more comfortable taking in food, quite frankly. Um, taking in something that's pleasurable, enjoying it, giving yourself permission to just be with that. Um, and so this is a great way to start in, in little ways. Another good one that isn't on this is taking compliments. If somebody compliments you, instead of automatically detecting it, which is what so many people have been trained to do, thank you, even if it makes you uncomfortable, okay? Um, and so there's a few ways that you can move beyond that playing small mindset. Playing small mindset. Um, and you can't talk about diet mindset without talking about body image too, um, because how we see our bodies, how we feel in our bodies is such a massive aspect of this. Um, and so it, these are just some basic starter points for how we can begin to use mindfulness to address body image issues. Um, first and foremost, I want to talk about body neutrality, um, and using neutral descriptors. I have been guilty of professing body love. Um, and when I say guilty, there's nothing wrong with body love. I do wish and hope that most people could find body love, but it is a big ask for a lot of people. And I've come to realize that not everybody can even get anywhere near body love. Um, and so instead, my language has shifted to body neutrality, moving away from harmful adjectives, moving away from hateful talk and hateful speech towards the body, towards a neutral descriptor. You know, my body is full, my body is functional, um, my body is um, a body, honestly. I mean, that's about as neutral as you can get. Um, you know, my body is awake, my body is present. Uh, going for these areas that are not loaded um, with a subjective judgment 
is a starting place. And a lot of times we can do that by focusing on function over um, the, you know, kind of more um, image oriented aspects over aesthetic. Um, and so really looking at like, what has your body done for you today? Woke me up, took me downstairs, it drank my yummy coffee for me. Um, it's breathing, it's living, it's getting through this pandemic. Um, you know, whether or not I like how it looks, it's doing all of this for me. Um, I look at the body as being the car that my soul drives around in while I'm here on this earth. And, you know, it's my job to take really good care of it. Um, and so, you know, and, and I want it to a car that's still working really well, um, as long as it possibly can, you know? And so um, that relationship, I don't, you know, I'm not a car person, so it's probably a metaphor that only goes so far with me, but a lot of people who love cars, I mean, they will baby their car and they will take such good care of it. And yes, that you can have joy in the aesthetic, but it isn't aesthetic over function. It's important to recognize that it's a sort of a dialectic of both, right? You know, um, not a rejection of one over the other. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, and so there's some time for, um, yeah, we've got 15 minutes for questions. But if we can't get to loving ourselves and our image and our body, one way you can start is by trying to shift the way you're looking at external beauty. So find practice finding beauty everywhere you can. I want you to practice as you go about your day. And again, COVID makes this entire presentation slightly shift because you may not be seeing a lot of people, but even if you're just in nature um, and maybe you're seeing people vis-a-vis -vis the television or the computer, um, I want you to find something that's beautiful to you. Again, beauty is subjective, but maybe it's their eyes. Maybe it's the way they're, they're um, and I'm talking about people here, but maybe it's the way they hold themselves. Maybe you think that they physically look beautiful, but maybe it's something more nuanced, like um, the way that their, you know, hair has, has turned silver, or perhaps it's um, a certain amount of wisdom that just seems to shine through their eyes. Um, I really want you to get um, as practiced in finding something about every single thing you see that you can find beautiful. It will help train your mind to see beauty, to broaden the aspect of beauty, just like we're trying to broaden this concept of health. Health is not just about the weight of one's body. And it's so much more than that. You know, health is about um, access to, to resources. Health is about, um, you know, our ability to connect and be in relationships that are safe. It's a relative measure of whether one has been exposed to trauma. I mean, there's literally in an hour and a half, I, I just can't do it justice. Um, but it's the same, you know, with beauty, we need to broaden this concept of what is beautiful. I saw someone talking about how we really need to stop talking about beauty altogether because why is that a marker anyway? Um, and, I, and I hear what they're saying and I agree with it. And here's the dialectic, I think, Yes, we can just stop talking about things being beautiful. Like her point was, we don't need to be beautiful. I'm not beautiful, I don't care. And I, I kind of loved it. But I also think one way of going into the same end game with that is beauty is whatever you want it to be. Again, this comes back to the message inherent in this entire presentation, which is we have got to become the point of authority for what we eat, how we eat it, when we eat it, and what it means to be a valuable human being. If we give our power away to diet culture, then we're really at their mercy. And when I say them, I am referencing a certain sort of institution and, and industries that are promote, uh, they're, they're, they're growing and they, um, there's a reason why they promote this level of sort of oppression and the need to constantly be at their mercy, whether it's through buying you know, products or not believing that we're good enough so we don't take up the space that I, think, I really believe we're here to take up. Um, there's a freedom in letting go of diet mindset that opens you up to a life that is unparalleled. Um, and so I am going to, I think that's the end of presentation and I'm going to open it up to questions. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know what access you'll have. I, I hope that you get a copy of this presentation, but I'm not sure how it works on GoToWebinar. So if you don't and you need the uh, PDF, I can send that. But this is uh, everywhere you can find me, um, more than enough places here. Um, again, lots of free information for you. I'm trying to put out good free content as much as I can. 
uh, through Facebook, Instagram, I have a YouTube channel. Um, and if you are interested in purchasing the book, you can go to my website. Apparently there's three, two C's in RebeccaBegg.com, but actually there's just one, shocker. And um, it's also available on Amazon too. So whatever's easiest for you, it's PayPal only on the website. But let me look over here now and see if we have any questions. Oh, yes, we do. Cool. All right, I'm going to do my best to do right by you. Um, oh, shoot. Okay. Work in a nonprofit company that takes places a very high value on wellness, but is not woke to diet culture. Yep, that is a problem. Okay, I'm going to read this out loud. I work at a nonprofit company that places a very high values on wellness, but is not woke to diet culture, mindset, etc. We have a very robust well-being program. We have things, weight, BMI, body fat, activity levels, and are financially incentivized yearly and quarterly. Um, the money is a big deal. Um, this is a partnership with local hospital systems. Um, the nurse who just reviewed my stats told me, just lose X pounds and you'll probably get the incentive next year. Right, okay. I've struggled with disordered eating, full-blown ED for 30 years. This is a major contributor um, to the worst relapse I've ever had. Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm seen as this noisy person in recovery from ED. Okay. Um, so this person is basically talking about, um, and I hope I do you justice here, but um, how really the medical profession a lot, I won't say all, but a lot of the medical profession and um, other aspects, in particular this person's company and the corporation, um, push and promote weight loss and um, basically prescribe that as the answer. And, you know, this person has been in recovery uh, for nearly 30 years and knows better and apparently is speaking up and feels like she's that person who is re in recovery from ED and is no... Um, noisy. Yeah. So what I'll say to that is this is a counterculture message. Um, I do this presentation a lot and I've done it to eating disorder uh, groups. I'm assuming this is one of them because, you know, if you're going to be following Nita or No Diet Day, you're probably already woke, as you say. Um, and then you have folks who are just swimming in water, just fish swimming in water. Um, man, you get a lot of pushback. And I will tell you, it's not easy. In fact, it's quite difficult. Um, and fear comes up for me when I do this presentation in non-ED environments. So I'm just gonna tell you, I, you don't have to be some massive warrior who's obtuse to you know, push back. If anything, I think it's just really human that it's difficult. You know, you're out there preaching a counterculture message and um, you get a lot of people who don't want to hear it because that means they have to take a look at their own stuff, their own internalized biases, their own fears, all the stuff. And honest to God, it is, um, it's going to fly at you because you're preaching a message that is asking them to take a look at their stuff. And so really what I want to do is validate you that it is hard and I'm so sorry you're up against that but I would encourage you to stay anchored internally and if you want to and you have it's not your job but if you want to and you have the desire to preach the counterculture message then by all means do so but just know that um, from time to time all of us need to just focus on our own needs and if that's too difficult for you that's okay too but please don't listen to what you know is going to um, harm you. Uh, and again, it's not your fault by any means, but do your best to reach out to those who you do know, share your belief system, and allow them to validate you. Um, because it's it's really, it's, it's a message that is growing in size, and I'm really um, impressed with how far we've come just in the last few years, but it's still very counterculture. Um, uh, okay, so question number two, what type of therapists are knowledgeable in the field of eating disorders? Um, I struggle with knowing if I need therapy, help, or dietitian. Okay, how would I know what best suits me? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and I had pointed you to IADA because there is a certification process for folks who are specialized in eating disorders. And quite frankly, I don't know about you, but I'd want to go to somebody who has done the work to get certified. It's just a, it's just a, um, a nice way to filter out folks that might be sort of um, jack of all trades. And so um, that website, it's iaedp.com, um, I think I did that right, um, has a list 
I also hear you asking, do I need uh, to work with a therapist or a dietitian? You know, these days, a lot of what therapists um, and dietitians do, there's a little bit of crossover, but in a, in a sort of basic sense, the therapist is going to talk about the emotional component and the dietitian is going to look more at the food patterns and the behavioral piece. That being said, there are a lot of dietitians who are doing emotional work these days. Um, and so I think if what you're wanting to address is your patterns of behavior, um, simply on like the more behavioral level and like how you, how you work with food, then a dietitian would be helpful. And, um, if you're looking to go deeper into the emotional and psychological aspect, a therapist probably would help. Um, that's a little bit of a broad answer. What I would say to you is go on their websites and check them out and then interview them. I think you'll have a good feel for like, if you like their style, um, and don't be afraid to do that. You're the consumer. By all means, if people want to call me, I have a 20 minute um, consultation that's free and split time for you to ask questions and that sort of thing. Most people are offering that. Um, and if you need any more help, um, the person who asked this question, feel free to email me because um, I'm going pretty quickly. Um, number three, do you have advice for living with a parent with toxic diet behavior during quarantine? Oh my word. Yes. Um, that is a loaded one. And sadly, I don't have nearly enough time to address it that I would like, but I will say this right now you're having an issue with uh, proximity boundaries. If you're quarantined with somebody, we all are. It's very easy for me to say, you know, leave, go away, find yourself a proximity boundary, but we can't do that. Um, and so the best that I can suggest is that we have to create an internal filter. You know, when we're out in the world and we're hearing diet messages, we have to be able to take that in and say, diet culture, diet culture. We have to be able to address it and name it and, and put it in, in its place. Otherwise, we'll act from it. We'll get triggered. And I'm not saying that naming it will mean you don't get triggered, but I want you to start to look at it through the lens of address it and name it as diet culture. And try to, I have found it helpful to try to see that, you know, anybody that's on a diet and is living in diet culture is not the enemy. We're not here to look down our noses at them. And they're certainly not to be mocked or to have people eye roll them. That's sadly something I'm seeing a lot of in culture. Like everybody is a victim of diet culture. And so your parent, I'm sure is very, very triggering, but they too are a victim and trying to just sort of see their pain and see them and their behavior and how painful it is so that you're not wanting to align with it um, might be a healthy place to start. By no means am I getting into the depths of what I think you're probably needing, but um, I hope that that helps. Um, okay, I've got three minutes of trying to get these all in. I'm an LMSW in Michigan, and I want to be an activist for educating others about this topic. Woohoo! We need all the peoples. So, <laughs> so glad. <laughs> Through my own recovery, I have come across so many uneducated medical professionals, right? I did take an opportunity to share information. Awesome. Um, about how their statements were impacting me. I sign action items when I come across them. Awesome. I'd love for it to be my career. Um, oh no. I just, um, any thoughts? I don't know where to start. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you so much for speaking up and, um, start by going on the Twitter chat tonight. I'm actually not kidding. Um, Anywhere, we need your voices. Uh, we are working together on this. As far as your career stuff, um, email me because I'll be able to answer it with more depth. But I would say um, it depends on which route you want to go. There are a lot of different routes, um, but there are ways without going back and getting, I have my master's. You can certainly go beyond that and get a PhD, but um, email me. I, I'm sorry to say that. I just want to answer this in depth and I uh, don't have a ton of time. Um, but whoever asked this question, it's Becca at RebeccaClegg.com. Um, I'm happy to answer this. Um, but there's a lot of ways you can be an advocate. You don't have to be a therapist, dietitian, although those two things work as well. Um, so we can have that conversation offline. Uh, let's see here. Diet culture is all around us and in our faces. What are some ways to protect ourselves from the messaging? Um, having a group of people that aren't exposed, well, we're all exposed, that aren't bought in is so important. If I didn't have my folks, my people who I could talk to, um, it'd be really frustrating. I'd feel really alone. Um, again, like I said, it's a counterculture message. Having things that you expose yourself to, following uh, counterculture, non-diet, body positivity accounts on social media is a great way to, again, we're trying to create balance here, right? So 
delete and stop following the accounts that make you feel bad and promote diet culture and follow the ones that promote inclusivity and body positivity. That's a great way to do it. Um, and as I talked about earlier, having that filter where we name it, diet culture, diet culture. You know, I've been doing this for over 15 years. Most people who know me know what I do and it's not their fault and they don't mean anything by it, but people talk diet stuff all the time to me. And I don't want to be in judgment of it because again, I don't think anyone's at fault, but I just name it, it's diet culture, it's diet culture. And I just kind of put it, I, I clearly put it to, to my to my left. I don't know if it's a spatial thing, but I just put it over here because I just, I know what it is. I know that it's triggering, but I don't need to respond to it. Um, so I recognize it. This is a mindfulness practice. Doing mindful eating or any of the mindfulness we talked about will help with this. You can look at it, you can know what it is, but there's a space between stimulus and response where you have some power and you can recognize what it is. Diet culture, not going to respond, not going to take the bait. So I hope that helps. And again, with any of these questions, if you want, if any of you need more in-depth stuff, you can email me. Um, can we speak a little bit more about embodiment? What does it mean exactly? Oh my Lord. Yes, we can, but uh, it's three o'clock. I'm going to go a little over and I, if you need to get off, um, sorry that I didn't have the time. Um, embodiment is actually um, my jam. I'm very into the concept of being embodied to really have the connection um, with your body and what that um, is like is, um, a process uh, that I believe we are all, if we're of this culture, um, having to reconnect. But it's being able to recognize what is coming, what we call bottom up instead of top down. So the signals that are coming from the body, being in the body, really landing in our body and being present in our body is not something we're taught how to do culturally. Most of us aren't taught by our parents. Some of us might be lucky. Um, and uh, it's quite frankly, something that I'm still learning as well um, and will probably be learning most of my life. But to really be in my body, one example, one, one small example is to be able to know what hunger feels like in my body as opposed to the notion or the concept of hunger, the idea of it. Those are two very different things. And so the practice of embodiment is in an ideal sense, being able to have that connection online most of the time, nobody's ever truly embodied all of the time. Um, but to be able to know how to access that when you need it. And um, I'm sure there's a variety of other ways I could explain it. But um, to me, that's what embodiment means in the context of what we're talking about. There are more, but this isn't enough time and they are very specific. I'm not sure what that is. Um, if I don't think that's a question. So all of that to say, if anybody has any more questions, I'll be at Twitter chat tonight. And as I've been saying, and I mean it, it's me responding to my emails. I'm not the quickest, but I do respond. So email me, I'm happy to help. And you can follow me again on Facebook or Instagram. And I do respond to DMs there too. I know this was really quick, but I hope you were able to take away one, just one reason why rejecting the diet mindset and diet culture could benefit you and that you take that and, and that that shows up for you um, in a way that impacts your life in a positive way. Thank you so much for attending. Really, really great to see everybody here and I'll see you tonight at the Twitter chat. Um, as part of our outro, I wanted to um, thank you all for being here and remember it is Twitter chat is six. I've got some notes here. Um, please also, we have a no diet day pledge that people are signing. So if you could sign that and share it on social media, that would also be a great way to be an activist today for no diet day. So, um, yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you guys for being here.